guys, it's good to be with you. This is, we're going to read, we're going to start Revelation 8, going into the woes of the trumpets with a small review of the rest. On our way to the beast, which is one of the most important parts of Revelation, certainly in the time we're living in right now. And many people have an idea of what the beast is. Uh, as well. See what you have not seen before. There are so many people, for some reason, for some reason, uh, we face a situation, again, in the Bible, where you have read something a thousand times, multiple times, and sometimes the overall picture of what it's conveying uh, can escape you. I'm excited to cover that part. I am. I, I do like clarity in, in, when it comes to Scripture. Clarity is wonderful. It really is. Relevant clarity is wonderful. Uh, we don't have to guess, nor do we have to assume. If we would ask, ask more frequently, right? One of the things I ask everybody not to do, try not to formulate a picture, right? Uh, we're reading this by scripture. So try to hear what the scriptures are saying. Of course, the Lord, he communicates this way. He always had this phrase, Jesus did. He said, let those with ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. In essence, what that means is those who are able to comprehend it, who are willing to comprehend the word at that moment, that word was for them. Those who are unable to comprehend it, it may not be for them at that moment. And that really, what that means is if you're really confused, and you ask your questions, and somehow you're still not grasping it. Don't worry too much. That's when you go in prayer, right? Prepare yourselves. And really consult the Lord. You really consult him. When you do that, making yourselves presentable, right? Every time you go in and pray in the first place with a sincere heart, you get in the right frame of mind. You also reflect upon your life. And it really grows you. Every time you pray, you grow because you begin to evaluate yourselves, right? And, of course, when you do that, the Lord gives you more and more and more. Now, he's not giving us information so we can be walking dictionaries. Remember something. God does not do anything in vain. That means a useless cause. You know that uh, scripture in the Bible when it says you're not to, it's a commandment. You're not to use the Lord your God's name in vain, right? I know a lot of people associate that with cursing. That's what we all heard when we were children. I give you a challenge. That word vain implies uselessness. Useless, to be, you know, uselessness. And how many times have we utilized the Father's name for no the name we're given is Jesus Christ. How many times have we used that word Jesus Christ for no reason whatsoever? That is what we're not supposed to do, to evoke or call out his name for nothing. Right? That means when you stub your toe, when you hurt yourself, don't holler out his name just because it's a punch phrase. That's using his name in vain. That is using his name for no reason, right? That's evoking the highest name given to creation itself. And it doesn't, it really doesn't matter how a person pronounces his name. I want you guys to think about something. The words that you use, the language that you speak, right, is refined by mankind. That means God gives us a language. But man adopts his own. Right? That's why we have so many different uh, deviants of the same language. God did set men multiple paths with different languages in the beginning. But since then, man has created unto himself multiple languages. Right? Multiple. So when we speak, it's nothing more than vibrations another person can understand. But the animals can't understand you. And if you speak in a specific language, somebody who does not speak in that language can't understand you. When you say the name of Jesus, 
out of your mouth are going to come vibrations. You're making sounds, clever sounds, but nonetheless sounds. That word can be empty and meaningless. You give meaning to the word based upon your own heart and your own soul. When we speak to one another, right, we recognize what each other is saying through those vibrations, noises, and everything else. God hears on a much deeper level. Much deeper level, right? So we can say anything, but if there's no association with that name, you, you're just making noise. In the other languages, that same word Jesus is used, and it does not mean the Son of God. It does not. It means that in the English language, right? It does not mean that in other languages. And the same is true in other countries. They can utter the name given above every name in their language. It's not going to match our language. So how can everybody be calling on the name of Jesus in different languages? And it sounds different, right? It's of a different dialect, the inflections and all those things, all the, the elements of that word are different. How can they truly be calling upon the Most High? His Son, how? It's of the soul. It's of your soul. In a dream, in meditation, in moanings and groanings, you do indeed speak to the Most High without words. When you're in a dream, you're not speaking out of your mouth. You're speaking in your heart and in your mind, not out of your mouth. If I speak something out of my mouth, that's so you can hear. Everything else around me can hear. Those things in the spiritual realm, they hear what the spirit says. Those things in the flesh realm, they hear what the flesh says. Right? If I pray out loud, it's so that you can agree or not. If I pray in silence, which means no words, it does not somehow nullify the entire prayer. No. It goes directly to the Most High. Many people are concerned about Satan hearing their prayers and somehow snatching it. No, he can't do that. It's not meant for him. It's not meant for him. When you speak truth, that's your father's language. When you speak sincerity, that's your father's language. You don't need words for that. I don't care if Satan hears my prayer. He's on death row. He cannot obstruct it. Hold it back or do anything to it. Take note in the book of Daniel. Before, before Daniel could finish praying, his entire prayer was heard before he ever finished the prayer. That should tell you something. In the realm of the concept of a prayer is the completeness of that prayer. God heard the whole prayer before Daniel spoke the whole thing. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? Because in the Bible, it says, when you set your heart to chasing yourself, Daniel, the Father was sending me. In other words, God heard him. When he set his heart to pray, God heard him and sent Gabriel with the answer before he ever began praying. See how that's on the inside of you? And that the words you speak out of your mouth follow what was born out of your spirit. See that? Hopefully you see that now. People get caught up on these small things in men's kingdoms because that's all men can understand. They can only understand flesh. They cannot understand the spiritual realm. Unless you become no good in the flesh. Don't worry about that. But just as we are not to use the Lord's name in vain, now that we know using his name in vain is to use it for no reason, like calling his name out after you hurt yourself, that's using his name in vain. Just as most people do not know that obvious thing, we're going to learn more things. Reading about the beasts, plural, not one beast. It's not just one beast. There's a 
is very simple. But all too often, it's incredibly complicated. Here's why. When anybody starts reading it, right, when you read this by yourselves, everybody else's words and ideas that you have listened to will come rushing back. Everybody's concepts will begin to come back. And what I'm asking you to do is go beyond the concepts, go beyond the words, and hear it yourselves. See it yourselves. With a clear mind, not by anybody else's interpretation, but to see the words of truth in truth. And you'll see a bit more than when what you did. You'll see a bit more. A little bit more. Somebody says, do you have to fast to be filled with the Spirit? No. God determines when somebody is filled with the Spirit. Man does not. We can have all the ceremonies on earth. God sends the Spirit, not man. If you guys look carefully, Satan, the adversary, his, one of his primary objectives is to get people to stumble to get them to be absent of the Spirit. So what he has done over time is he sent agents, and it takes, you guys have the ability, right? You do. So you can investigate these men of the cloth who have come in and altered the words of the apostles and of our Lord and have taught them to other people making amendments in the Word of God. The Word of God has still been around. The Bible has still been around. But they speak an amended word. They speak it out of the mouth, something different, causing people to believe that somehow you have to be granted power by a man that God will not do it directly. Jesus came with the opposite message to the Pharisees, Sadducees, and all those guys who were in charge. He said, nobody has to go through you anymore. That's what he taught his disciples. They did not like that. They didn't like the fact that he took the middleman out. That's why in that passage, what does it say? You can go boldly to the throne of grace to find help in a time of need. It didn't say you had to go through anybody else. Now, what man has been doing ever since that time of Christ is fighting tooth and nail to undo the words of Christ, to get everybody to go back through men again. That is the blind leading the blind. See, to submit yourself to somebody is one thing. To demand that someone bow to you is another. And essentially, people on this earth are causing other people to bow to them, holding them hostage, saying that God won't bless them because of this reason and that reason. And that the only way they can get anything from the living God is through some earthly vessel. Wrong. Wrong. Your very life is a blessing directly from God that has nothing to do with humanity. Every single last one of us deserved death. For the smallest of infractions, our minds are foul, thoughts have been foul. We plotted murder on a high degree even against those we love. In the Bible, it says, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. We have been there. There has been someone in our family we have strongly disliked. We deserve death, not life, but we're alive, not dead. And we have been sustained, and we have been kept. It is not coincidence all those things came together over and over and over and over again to spare your life to get you out of harm's way. You've been kept all this time. And it just so happens you really believe in Christ. And in 2023 and 24, it just so happens. Many are now saying, do I really have the spirit or not? And that's a beautiful thing. Because they're sincerely searching. And when you do that, and you search in that realm of truth through Christ, that's when you start receiving. But I have to warn you, Satan is on his job and he does not rest. He will attempt over and over again 
to get you to surrender your pursuit of Christ directly. Let me give you a ploy he's pulled on some of you. There was a time you were looking directly for the living God through Christ. And you were pressing. And it was difficult. Because there were brand new concepts. And your, your mind was opening up to the most high. And it was different. All of a sudden, somebody came into your life. And they gave you an opportunity to submit to flesh again. Not knowing any better, you did so. And it felt secure at the moment. It felt like, because you were doing what everybody else did, that you were secure. That's what you felt like. Until you began to see what nobody else could see. You started to notice what nobody else could notice. Small little differences in the Word of God that would lift man above the Word of God. And you couldn't shake it. To some of you, it's with you right now, this very day. For the sake of everybody around you, for the sake of fitting in, there's a type of surrender a person will do to hide within the crowd. But the Lord open your eyes just a little bit to see how men love glory. Oh, how they love to be number one. The Lord allowed you to see that. You think that was an accident? So many of your brothers and your sisters have seen the exact same thing. No. In these days, the Lord wakes his children up to the truth. And that truth, it is indeed the truth. You know it's the truth when the agents come and try to get you to surrender again. And every time they try to get you to surrender you know how that happens, don't you? You have to forego believing in Christ as the Lord has given to you, which is common among your brethren and your sisters. And you have to start believing like somebody else. That's how you know. Because every time they take you into their folds again, the only way they can do that is if you begin to believe a way that is odd or strange to you. That's the troubling many people have in this world right now. And they can't put their finger on it. But don't worry. See, because no person ever has to break another person free of that. Jesus said he would do it. He would do it. And ironically, while many are talking about the wolf, the wolf is going to help out a lot. That wolf is loose. And many more on the way. Issues and circumstances. Situations that try. They'll demonstrate. Or have one. Shout from the rooftops. Who they are in truth. Anyway. Revelation. We shall go into it. Because knowing who the beast is. Right? Right? Knowing exactly who it is, is not important. Do you know why I say that? Because God will reveal who this individual is. Knowing the beast by way of scripture is important. That's very important. You have elements out there in the world right now that are attempting to be this very beast that you guys read about in Revelation, that we will read about in Revelation. But there's not just one. There are two beasts. And there are not just two beasts. But there's a dragon that's being worshipped right now. You're going to learn that in Revelation it states, And the world worshipped the dragon, which gave power to the beast. And they worshipped the beast. Here's the problem. The dragon was already being worshipped. And it said the world worshipped the dragon before the beast came on the scene. Uh-oh. That means right now, people worship the dragon. But the dragon is not a person. When your eyes open to that, 
get ready to see a lot more. Now, in proportion to, to the faith the Lord has given you, he's given each of us a measure of faith. He will open your eyes to a certain degree. That's based upon your faith. He will never open your eyes so much. He will overwhelm you and cause you to slip. He's not doing that. But your eyes will be opened. And your ears will be opened. And once they're opened, you're going to hear things from flesh that are in stark contrast to those things of spirit. Remember something, flesh will always speak for itself. It will elevate itself. It will do everything to sustain itself. But the spirit is full of sacrifice. Nowhere in the Bible did you ever hear of God. Not sacrifice. Not giving his all to us. Isn't it strange? How when we were growing up, we were told to have faith in God. We were told that. But the Lord told us something different, didn't he? Here's what he said. He said, believe in me. You know what that is? That's not a command. That's a plea. That's a question bound in love itself. He moved heaven and earth for us. He didn't give up on us. That means he has faith in us. We're still here, which means he has faith in you. He sent his son to die for you. And people are going to fall away, which means he already knows everybody will not say yes. So then everybody who does say yes, he has faith in them. He has faith in you. All of you out there that say, I can't do this, I can't do this and that, and what you can't do. You can't overcome this and can't overcome that. You need to know something. Your father has faith in you. And you're going to keep trying. Do you know that? He has faith in you. And you still believe in him. And according to the word of God, you cannot do that. You cannot believe in Christ on your own. You know, that's one of the most powerful signs. At any time, the sign is your belief. If you actually believe in Christ, you actually believe that he died on the cross, died and was raised again. Not one of those who disputes it, but those who believe it. If you actually believe that, God put that belief in you that you may be kept. He put that in you because he has faith in you. So you're going to learn something one day if you haven't already. While most people are trying to stay away from sin and everything is a task, when you find out what Christ did, and who your father really is. That's when you'll have a desire. To never dishonor him again. That's when your battle with sinning. Will be over. See when you're trying to get rid of something. That you have a desire for is pretty difficult. Pretty hard to put down cigarettes. When you still like to smoke cigarettes. But when you find out who your father is. The more you find that out, the more you find out who Christ is. You're going to start looking at these things of men and of sin. You're going to see what they're doing. How things slip in behind them. Nobody will tell you anything, but you will look at it and say no more. Because you will see how it caused you to dishonor your father who has all faith in you, the one who died for you, the one who actually did everything for you, you'll see how sin dishonors him, and you won't have that in your life, and you won't care about the cost. And when you get to the stage where you don't care how much it hurts to say no to sin, when you start to look at sin, and you say, how dare you come and try and get me 
to dishonor my loving father. When you get to that point, and you don't care how bad the withdrawal symptoms hurt, you don't care how bad the pain is, the distress is, the sacrifices are, you don't care what they cause, that's when your father steps in. That's when you find out. Yep, he has faith in me. Because every single time when you exhaust everything that you can exhaust, when you give a situation your all, I mean your all, when you give it your all, you don't ask for help. Do you know that? Do you guys know that? Anybody who gives a situation their all is not going to ask for help. Do you know why? They're willing to give everything up for it. They don't ask for help. When you give something your all, you're already ready to make a sacrifice. You're not asking for help. And I'm telling you, that's when your father shows up. Because when you give a situation your all, that's when your soul speaks out in your original language. That's when you operate in truth and all faith. Because you can't give a situation your all unless you're standing in absolute faith and in truth. Do you know that? That's who you are. That's why that statement, that sentiment, that little image that you just got in your head, that's why it connects with you. Do you know why it connects with you? It's part of your language. It's part of your truth. Some of you have not done that before. But you have that desire within you. It is pounding everything to get out. That's why you connect with that statement. You just did that. Your spirit inside is ready to stand up to do the unthinkable in righteousness and in truth, not the phony stuff. We're going to read in Revelation 8 and 9, my prayer. Is that you see Anne here? Comprehend. I want to take a break. And when I come back, we're going right into it. I'll be right back. Okay. I want to make sure everything was, uh, I've been streaming. All right. Let's go, shall we? I believe it's Nate. Now, we read about those trumpets. By the way, I want you guys to take note of something. Just take note of it. Prior to the trumpets, we had the ceiling of the 144,000. I know many people want to be a part of the 144,000 from Reuben, and Nephilim, and Levi, and Joseph, Benjamin, Manasseh, and Gad, and all those tribes. But what about the trillions of people? who have already gone on to be with the Lord. See, because in this book, I want you to keep this in mind. In this book's a statement, and I do not believe it's a lie, and it says, Blessed is he who reads and keeps the words of this prophecy. How could that be relevant for those in the time it was given? Was it relevant? Of course it was. Was it a blessing? If they kept it, yes. Because something happens when you keep it. Not keep the theories of revelation. But if you read it and know it, and keep the communications that were gathered and compiled, distributed and eventually read because if you keep it you walk in a certain way in life it becomes armament during the seals and by the way at the beginning of the book of revelation it says what the time is at hand that means the time was now we have this problem that was human beings in our modern-day society, we 
have a problem with time, our perception of time. If trouble does not come directly to us, we reject that anything is happening. We've been trained to do that. This entire earth has been the murdering grounds of billions, if not trillions, tens of trillions, hundreds of trillions, probably more than that than people. So many people have been murdered on the earth, killed on this earth. So many that it becomes a non-topic. It becomes usual. You don't think that's by violence. Having this prophecy means that people are able to read it and to observe it as time went on. This prophecy was observed again and again and again. But there was always coming a generation that would see the whole thing being fulfilled. I have a strong inclination to believing you are of that generation. Many people look at Revelation and they have for a long time saying things are coming. They did the same thing with Christ. Even when Christ was here, they said it was coming. They missed him being here. Revelation is no different. People always say it's coming, ignoring what's here in front of them right now. Why? Because of our perception with time. We see in this day, this hour, this week, we don't often see 20 years at a time, 50 years at a time. Because if we did, none of us would doubt the urgency of this prophecy we would have seen the change of humanity and how violent humanity has become. You want to see the world? God has allowed us to have a tool. We don't worship it, thus it's a tool. You can see exactly what the world demands. How so? Observe a television channel. Go to the one with the highest ratings, and you'll find out what people are craving. Whatever a person craves, they quench. They fulfill. They go out and get it. That is the sum total of what society has become. The majority of the people. You are a remnant. Those of you who believe in Christ, you are indeed a remnant. You've noticed even among your own family members, they believe in a very different way. Take sin, for example. Sin has become a burden so much so that people have walked away from trying to get away from sin. Like a person who can't quite get things right. Let me give you one small piece of advice. For a person who would say, well, you know, I'm trying, but I keep just giving in to it. Let me give you one piece of advice. Jimmy Crack Corn. That's what you say. The measure of you is not what you avoid. It's your intent and how you get up. If you fall, get back up and go forward again and never give up. It's your persistence that knocks down every single door. Your persistence, that's how you're going to finish this race. That's why in the Bible it says this race is not given to the swift. No. That's why Jesus said, if you run and you don't faint, this race is given to those who refuse to give up and to give in. If you fall flat on your face a billion times and get up a billion times, determine yourself to overcome. But everything around you says you cannot and never let your situation define your relationship with your father. Let your situation, your issues speak to you. 
silence them. You get up. Don't let anything else push you somewhere. Get up and go forward in righteousness, no matter how many times you fall. You don't think your father knew you were going to fall? He did. That's why from the beginning, he prepared to send his son. Because he knew we would fall. You think Satan was a big shocker to him? It was not. I believe strongly that God created this creation for his creation. And it's including time. See, I believe that God has already embraced you at the end. I do. I believe that. I believe that he's already witnessed you finishing this race. I believe that God is at the beginning right now. He's with us right now. And he's at the end right now. I also believe we cannot comprehend that. I believe the greatest scientists have been trying to prove something that can only be discovered spiritually. They'll find no answers. Not in this creation. That would be like an ant discovering the entire globe and all that's in it from inside of a matchbox. And he has no access outside. Same thing. Just as that ant would be cut off, so would the average person be cut off from seeing the truth of all things, how things are connected. So what do we end up doing as human beings? We start theorizing. We're made in the image and likeness of the creator. That does not mean we look like him. It means we have certain traits. Creation is part of those traits. In order to create, a vision must be established. A forethought must be there. And we're full of thoughts, aren't we? Thoughts we don't know what to do with. We occupy most of our time in thought. Do you guys know that? Most of your life is spent not in the world, but in thought. An evaluation, a discovery of things. Keep going. But go with your eyes opened. Because you're not in one of those passive generations. There are things happening around you that you don't know about yet. A great many do. But you don't know about them yet. The ones who do know about these things going on, they have a different belief because of what they see. We have a walk of faith. We are to walk by faith, which means believing in the word of God without seeing. To have it based on trust. And a hope in eternal salvation through Christ. Once that's established, the walk changes. We have to remind ourselves and do just like King David did. Do you not know he encouraged his own soul? He reminded his soul who they belong to. Do you know that? We have to do the same. We do that through reading. Instead of daydreaming. Become educated in the word of God. Operate in the word of God. No longer fighting with the Lord. Trust is going to be based on your relationship with him and the time you spend with him. We spend time with the Lord through reading and prayer. Once you pray, you can observe and expect. That brings everything full circle. And then you too will understand that you cannot explain certain things to people concerning faith. You can't. Either a person will go through it and know it. Or they won't go through it and they will not know. But if you believe in Christ, you're meant to know it all. Everything. That's why you get back up again. No matter how many times you fall. And you purpose yourself to go forward in the Lord. Out of love, not obligation. 
Salvation is based in love. Be careful not to adopt the mindset of a taskmaster. Like somebody is beating you with a whip. That is the flesh, not of the Father. That is satanic, not of the living God. God operates by invitation, not by force. And if you're not careful, you will adopt the doctrine of force, which is the dominant doctrine of this very day that we live in. Or we're going to challenge that too, so that you can see it. In other words, what I'm telling you is that all of us have been operating by force. And that only through Christ and walking the way he prescribed us to walk. Can we escape that? There is a deity appointed over force. And it's being used in this world. Everything in this world is by way of force. Everything is obligation. Everything was purposely established that way. And we're going to bring most of that out too. That'll be throughout all our studies. Why? It's time to see. Once you see it, you will have seen it. Right now, you may not know what I'm talking about. But the truth is, you really do know what I'm talking about. You were born in the middle of it. It's just that not too many people are willing or know enough to make it visible until you see how destructive it is. You discover that. Now the trumpets and the seals, many are sealed by faith. You remember what Jesus said? I'll say it again. I say it many times here at COT. All who have come to me, the Father hath given me, and I will in no wise cast out, and I will raise them up the last day. That's a seal. That's a promise. That's a promise. The Lord said, it is the will of God that he not lose any of us. And that means you actually have to belong to him. Not by your merits. No. It's not based on what you accomplish. Nope. It's not based upon you overcoming all your sin. Nope. It's about him being in you as you are in him. It's about your surrender to him. How do you surrender to him? It's very easy. You grew up in a specific way. You've learned specific things. You have a specific culture. But when it comes to righteousness, the Lord taught one thing. That it was to be by love and by truth. See, many are not willing to sacrifice anything that they have, which means give it up, and to walk in love, in a trust of the Messiah. Many are far too defensive for that. So guess what? They cannot follow him. The only way to follow Christ is by way of love which means you have to lay down and let go of these hateful, violent ways taught to you by the world. Your ways of survival. Once you lay that down and walk by love and faith, that's when you begin to see the Lord's hand at work. And once you see the Lord's hand at work, you will become an experiencer. Once you have experienced the help of the Most High, your faith is locked in. That's when you're in your ambassadorship of the kingdom. You're already sealed that way. You have that promise over you. Now, the 144,000, in Revelation, it tells us what they are. Listen, sometimes the answer to things can be so simple. It just simply escapes us. We don't want things to be simple. We like complicated things. And all of us, we all know that. If it's not complicated, it looks like it's cheap, correct? Isn't that right? Like a bottle opener, right? Do you guys know what those are, bottle opener? All people with these fancy bottle openers, and then some guy walks up, takes a bottle and taps it on a piece of wood, right? Or a piece of anything, and the bottle cap comes right off. Or they do it in a way they twist it in a certain way where the metal gives away. It's designed to do that, but not too many people know that. 
And so people really think they cannot open the bottle unless they have a bottle opener. And many still won't attempt to open a bottle any other way. And it got so bad, they quit making those bottles. Do you guys know that? They quit making them. They did. Now you find them with uh, alcoholic beverages. Not with standard grade consumer beverages, right? Why? Because they found that people were looking for something else. Why? Because they did the study, they actually did a study and they found out that many people thought that if you did not have a bottle opener, right, that you would damage the bottle. And that glass would taint the beverage. They actually thought this and people thought that. So because of that, people had a limitation. They couldn't adopt the easy way of opening the bottle. They had to have the tools specifically made for it, right? A man-made tool made for the bottle. The man told them, this is how you open it. And when people have those instructions, well, they feel they need it. Same thing has happened to the Word of God in these days. People have given instructions on everything. Seven to ten steps to everything in the Bible Jesus gave us principle for. Now, clearly... Some people did this after the fashion of, of the corporate world back in the day, these infomercials, so on and so forth, for wealth. They did. We know they did it for wealth because they went out and bought books. The Seven Steps of Prosperity for twenty nine ninety five. You guys have heard me before. If somebody actually has seven steps to prosperity, that was backed by the Bible. They wouldn't sell it. They would be prosperous and would give it away. Correct? But that's not what happened. But nobody cared that they were selling it. Nobody could actually see that principle. That if indeed a person was prosperous, they would be prosperous enough and such a spiritual thing to give it all away to everybody. But that's not what they were doing. They sold it. And they sold many copies of it. So that, you know, you can see by that that people, it's very difficult for people to accept the simplistic things in life. But it's quite simple. These 144,000 had to be sealed so they would not die. So they would not be harmed. The angels sealed them. The angels could see that seal of the living God in their foreheads, and thus the angels that had power to destroy the earth did not touch them or the foliage. But they did torment everything else. And everything else had no mercy. So that 144,000? They were sealed because they have to be here in a very rough time. The trumpets, they were here. You're going to see that. And there's a full accountability of mankind during these times. You will see it. So without further ado, let's go read, shall we? We get all the way, 144,000, the seals, we get all the way up to the trumpets, right? I just want to point that out about the 144,000. That will pop up again. You're already sealed. Already with the promise of Christ. You cannot go to Christ and give your life unless the Father has given you to Christ. And that serves as a seal. Your faith is a seal. Jesus spoke a promise over your life. Didn't he? That if you believe in him, then in him you have everlasting life. You've already been sealed. Hence you have the 144,000. And you have you. Revelation chapter 8. We see something. I have to point this out. We see a golden censer. Right? It was the smoke of the incense. 
comes from the prayers of the saints, it sends up before God. The angel takes that censer, fills it with fire from the altar and casts it into the earth. And there were thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Now, an earthquake in a dream is odd, right? It's very odd. But it, this implies a physical happening. Right before this, we read the seal. For there were souls of men on the altar who had been killed for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. And they were told to wait a little season until their fellow brethren were to be killed as they were, till that number was reached. So there's a finite number of martyrs, a very specific number of martyrs. And when that number is met, it's over. It's over. But there was a, they were told to wait a little season. To wait. But see, while they were told to wait, the seals were still happening. And then we get up here to the, we get to the ceiling of the 144,000. But it didn't mention them. Right? You're going to see them specifically mentioned again in Revelation. It's a beautiful passage. And now we're in the trumpets. The prayers of the saints were cast, were, were, were mixed, right? They were taken up. They went up before God and fire from the altar came down from God on the earth. God said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. What do you think that represents? When fire, right, from the altar is cast into the earth, out of the angel's hand, in which came, with the incense that came up before God, right? Those coals from the altar come down to earth. We know what the coals represent. Why are they always burning? That is the vengeance of the Most High. But specifically, his vengeance deals with those incense. That's why they went up before God. That's why they were kept. That's why those those. Those souls under the altar were crying out because their situation, their issue had not been dealt with yet. And the Lord told them to wait a little season. Wait a little season. See, he kept that, didn't he? He didn't do anything about that, did he? Man, he did nothing about it until an appointed time. And during that appointed time, the earth is in trouble. Now his vengeance is coming into the earth. This is the release of the trumpets. For God's vengeance is, and he will avenge every happening of his own. Where his vengeance is and who it's upon, there is no grace. And there is no mercy. The same with angels, they sound their trumpets. You know about the first angel sound. Hail, fire, mingled with blood, was cast into the earth, and all the green grass burned up a third of the trees. Second angel sounds, and a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood, and a third part of the creatures in the sea died. That's merciless, right? And a third part of the ships were destroyed. And a third angel sounds, and a great star fell from heaven, burning as it were lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. And of course, the name of that star is called Wormwood. And its effect was that the waters had become Wormwood, or bitter. And many men died, not from the impact, but many men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. The fourth angel sounds. And a third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon, third part of the stars. So as a third part of them was darkened, and, a, and the day did not show for a third part of it in the night likewise. And now, the other trumpets are about to blow. And so here we're going to read, a, a big woe came before them. Revelation 9, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto earth. And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose smoke out of the pit, as smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Won't you take notice of something? This angel 
had the key to the bottomless pit. He did not come out of the pit. But he had the key. It says to him, uh, listen to what it says. It says, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. So he didn't steal it. He was assigned it. So it's not one of the devil's angels which has the key to the bottomless pit. This is the warden, the keeper. Right? Later on in Revelation, it turns out to be the same one that bound Satan up a thousand years. And he's identified as the angel with the key to the bottomless pit. That's his identification. So, we have these objects. It looks like that blot out a part of the sky and then all of a sudden an angel is given a key to the bottomless pit and comes down and opens up the pit. At that time, it means smoke will arise out of the earth. A thick smoke. And it says there came out locust upon the earth. Unto them was given power. Scorpions of the earth have power. Everybody know what power scorpions have? Hmm? Everybody? And why scorpions? Why didn't it have the power of a, of a hornet? Those were known back in those days. Bees were known back in those days. Why not that type of power? Power of a scorpion. Well, guess what Jesus said? It just so happened Christ dealt with this before this was ever given to John. The Lord told you something about scorpions and serpents, didn't he? He gave you power to do what? Bread upon scorpions and serpents. You have that power. He never contradicted himself, ever. I know you have people who think he did, but they they can't see spiritual things. That's why. You have power to tread upon scorpions and serpents. And he said, nothing will by any means hurt you. And then in that same, in that same uh, book, the book of Acts, we indeed had an apostle that got bit by a snake, a poisonous snake. Guess what he did? He didn't do anything. He just shook it off, kept going. Did the poison take effect on him? No, it did not. Is that is is that a true thing? You better believe it's true. You better believe that's true. If anything ever comes at you, listen to me. When you have a sincerity towards Christ, and you begin to follow him in that path of love and obedience, he will grant unto you power to tread upon scorpions and serpents because he will send you where scorpions and serpents are. He's not going to give you power over something you will never confront. Do you guys hear me? If he gave you, see, a lot of people want, to, oh, I want power. I want to make sure I have that power. What, what, no. First, you have to be willing to obey his voice. Those he gave power to tread upon scorpions and serpents. He also assigned to go where there were scorpions and serpents. He gave them all power over the enemy. And they went right into the place where the enemy was. See, there's a chickenness in part of today's believers, and it's not their fault. It's culture. People were, you know, kind of sidetracked in the 80s. Is something altered within the body of Christ that causes everybody to run away from every danger they see. You don't have to run away. In fact, your father is the one through Christ who will assign you to go in areas that nobody else will go into. He's giving you power to tread on scorpions and serpents. Here we have them being let loose. And they bother Christian. No. They cannot. But again, the key is, when God gives you power over something, he's going to send you to that something. He didn't do anything in vain, does he? No. But what have people done? People want to make it seem like God will only send his people to the nice, clean areas. Wake up call. 
The same gospel that they carried is in the earth now. Revelation is a seal and a record of the end of that gospel. We're not at the end. Let's continue to read here. And there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth. And unto them was given power, scorpions of the earth had power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth. Neither any green thing, neither any tree. But only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. Now does Christ, did Christ ever once speak about you being tormented? No, he did not. In fact, he spoke the opposite, didn't he? He told us about the journey and what would be in the journey. But he also told us we would overcome because he would be with us. He would never leave us nor forsake us. That he would pray to the Father and the Father would send another, another comforter in his name. And that's how. He would be with us always because right after that he'll said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So in this case, suppose you're on earth. You're a Christian, a believer. You're on earth. And you're not sealed. Could these things touch you? Yes or no? Could they touch you? Come on, somebody with faith, give me an answer. Could they touch you? Now, if you don't know, you don't know. But could they touch you? I'll give you my answer. My answer would be no, they cannot. Because you see what God did, don't you? It was commanded them that they not touch any green thing or any tree. Only those men who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. What seal does God place upon anything? You ready? It starts with an L. Life. 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 Remember when in the Bible it says, Jesus said, I, I, I would that you have, you have life and have life more abundantly. You remember that? You remember when he said God is the God of the living and not the dead? Hmm? You remember when he said, let the dead go bury the dead? Have you noticed a green tree is alive? A green thing is alive. If it's not green, it can be considered dead based upon the context of what we're reading. So these things will not touch anything marked with life. And what did the Messiah do to you when you gave your life to him? If you gave your life to the Lord, and that statement comes from him giving his life for yours, your ball with the prize, then your life is sustained within him. And if your life is sustained within him, you are marked for life, not for death. Because you're partakers of the resurrection of Christ into eternal life simply by your belief in him. See, now listen to me. That means if you truly believe in Christ, right? You are sealed in a way that nothing can unseal you. Do you hear me? That seal has been upon you. That seal is your faith. So what happened to the 144,000? They had to be sealed by the angels before this happened, or they would have died, which means they weren't too... Uh, fantastic before their sealing, were they? No, they're just appointed for that time to do something very special. But they have to be around in a time where they see living things die. They will see the accursed things. You're also going to find out exactly who they are. But, but now I'll admit, I don't know where the disconnect came. Because you have a lot of people saying, they're one of the 144,000, but that would void the seal that Jesus has already given in the New Testament to you. 
Why would God seal you twice? There's no need to seal you twice. You're sealed of the highest order by way of your faith. And your faith can be seen of Satan and every demon out there. Do you know that? Your faith. Your faith. Is like a city. Lit up on a hillside. That cannot be hid. Your faith. Everything can see that. That's why Christ warned you of the adversary. But the 144,000 had to be sealed by the angels. You were sealed at birth. You were sealed when you were sent here to this earth. Why? Because the scriptures still exist. Jesus stated all who have come to him, the Father has given him. And if God gave you to Christ, you've been sealed before you were in your flesh. So what is this 144,000? It's already mentioned in other parts of the Bible. But people act like what Jesus did is not enough, that they need an additional seal. See, that's only protecting your own behind is what that is. People want to be the 144,000 because they're spoke of in such notoriety by way of their condition because they were sealed. I've heard people, oh, I don't want to go. I don't want to see those things come out of the pit. I'm one of the 144,000. No, you're not because you're not a virgin. It says they have had, they've not been corrupted by a woman. That is to have the ways of flesh. They don't, how can you be? How can anybody not have the ways of flesh? There's only one way a person can be kept from that. There's only one way, not two ways, not three, one way. To not be corrupted by a woman, there's only one way. That's a huge statement, there's only one way. They're also mentioned about later on in Revelation. They did something very specific and that's all they did. So what about the promises of Christ to us? See, Jesus gave us a promise, didn't he? He gave us a promise. He gave us a promise, and he said he would raise us up at the last day. See, we forget about that one. He would raise, well, if he's going to raise us up, how can we be one of the sealed? They're sealed after the fact, and everybody missed the original can know Greek, evidently, because it identifies their lineage. Not only are they of the original 12 tribes of Israel, but they're evidently very tiny. Pure souls, there's another word for a pure soul. It's called a baby. A pure soul is a baby. That's how they can be virgins. That's how they can be untainted by a woman. Babies, specifically male babies. It does not mean they're the only ones going into the kingdom. No. Before the 144,000 are sealed. Right? Before their sealing is complete, something has happened to God's people. They are with him. They came out of great tribulation. That's called life. See, a lot of people see that. Well, they came out of great tribulation. Really? That's the same word for life. It's the same description. Somebody in here, tell me your life has not been great tribulation. And if this word is relevant for everybody who lived prior to this day, their lives were great tribulation too. And if the word, because at the beginning of this, it says the time is at hand. It also says, in this prophecy, blessed are they who read the words of this prophecy, right? It said, don't change anything or anything else. So it's very important. Look at history. Look at what happened since Christ has been here on this earth. And you tell me there's not been massive and great tribulation on the earth unless we're blind. How many, how many? Understand what the word genocide means. Do you realize humanity enslaved humanity? Do you know what that means? 
That means children grew up under a taskmaster, a whip. They saw their parents die. They were beaten for labor. The blood of innocence cries out from underneath the soils in the USA, in Europe, all over the world. You think it stopped? No, it has not. This world is tribulation. Your life is tribulation. So what happens if your life is not so turbulent? The apostle said, be thankful. Because somebody suffered before you so that you would not have to suffer. So that you could learn without going through the experience and spare you some time and some heartache and headache. But that life would be tribulation. It even told us in other scriptures, don't think it's strange when you go through fiery trials. It's been our lives. And then we read in the book of Revelation. When John was speaking to that angel, and the angel was excited, saying, Who are these, arrayed in white? That's what the angel asked John. And John says, Sir, thou knowest. And the angel said, These are they who came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. How do you wash your robes? That's a refinement process called life. That's life. It's not instantaneous. To wash something is to scrub it over and over and over and over and over again. Isn't that our lives? You better believe it. Is this like the taskmasters in Washington, D.C.? No, they're not even close to taskmasters. They're not whipping anybody. They're not. They're not whipping anything. They're having theater up there, and then people go along with it. Can't you see what's happening? They, uh, listen to me real carefully, real quick, then I'll take a break. We'll come back and go right back to the trumpets. But in Washington, D.C., they start speaking a bunch of stuff. Correct? They speak, speak, speak. They make rules and everything else. They have not forced anybody to do anything. They haven't. I want you guys to see it for what it is. They have not. What people have done is they cause people to force people to do things. Can't you see that? Who enforces what they say in Washington, D.C.? Your neighbor does. That's who enforces it. Your neighbor does. It's through the social order. Can't you see that? People, your neighbors are, they, they listen to what they say and they expect you to do it. And if you don't do it, you're socially ejected. Do they get their hands dirty? Nope. They're causing your neighbor, your family members to do that work. So what happens when you follow Christ? You're of a higher standard. What they've essentially done is almost like the mob. You have the bosses and the people who carry out the orders of the bosses. That's what's happening. Look at the border problem. Look at this border issue. Is anybody forcing anybody to do anything? Nope. They're not. Think about it. They're not. They're not. They're not forcing anybody to do anything. But you have a culmination of ideologies springing forward. They're causing people to turn on each other. Every time they have an unsettled policy, they break up families, marriages, long-standing relationships, causing people to strangle one another. Let me give you a better picture of this. What it really is, is suppose you had a dog specimen that weighed 500 pounds. Now, suppose you had one million of those 500-pound dogs, and you have one guy with a leash, a leash made of some cheap thread, and it's tied to those 500-pound dogs. But the dogs have been trained to always follow the leash. Thus, the one guy with that chicken thread can lead all those dogs around. And 
the dogs because of, they believe they must follow the chicken thread. They're going to be led all the days of their lives. No matter what they do, no matter how they fight each other, they're still going to follow the thread. That's what's happening in the world. People are complicit. Somebody likes what they're doing in Washington. Washington speaks it. The people actually do it. And the people enforce other people to do it. And as soon as you don't agree, everybody's going to look at you. You're going to get those emotions, that feedback mechanism. And if they get strong enough, you're going to fall right back in place. And when you become part of that team, you'll enforce somebody else to do it. When you get old and tired of it, somebody else will take up your mantle and carry it on. No bars, no handcuffs, no chains, no anything. By way of ideologies, people are effectively enslaved, trapped. They can't even think their way out of it. Not your adversary. Only he would be devious enough to do that. God presents the truth. The truth of darkness and light, and he says, choose. He will not force. He'll always say, choose. But Satan. He will ensnare you. And then he'll keep his hands clean by making you do his dirty work. Until you stop falling for it. For a believer in Christ, that's when you believe in Christ. Because when you believe in Christ, you uncover the veil of this world. Because when you believe in Christ... You hear him. When you hear him, you embrace his words. And when you embrace his words, you walk by them. When you walk by them, all illusions and delusions fall away. When they fall away, you stop in your tracks. Because you see it. But there's a problem. There's no way to communicate what you see. But you start speaking. Praying for others that they will simply hear the Lord. Now, there's some counter philosophy against what everybody's doing in the world, but to hear the word of the Lord. That is the breakthrough. That breaks the delusion. That takes down the veil. That restores sight to the blind. That makes the lame walk. It is the word of the living God, and all that was encapsulated in Christ Jesus. And you have the power to present that to anybody on the face of the earth. And nothing is stopping you but you. Lord, he knows exactly what he's doing. That's why many of you feel the strain of this time. Sometimes some of you feel so trapped spiritually that you just want to run. Your flesh wants to run away. You can see something coming. It's causing people to try and get a hold of the old days. Though these are the very days that most, if not all of you, desire to see in 2007, 2008, 2009, and every loud mouth boast that man gave back during that time, they have broken and they can't even see what the Lord has done. He's preparing a table. It won't be long now. Because he's never, he's never gotten this table ready for anybody. It's almost ready. I hope that you're ready. But that's up to you. Okay, everybody, we are back. Let's go into the description of these things. By the way, in Revelation 9, 6, and in those days men will seek death and shall not find it. They shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Not good. 
I read something very old. And it talked about a time similar to this. Where people would want to commit suicide. And when they gave the reasons, listen to what they said. In fact, it's in too many different cultures, the exact same thing. After the demise of cities, men would seek refuge in caves and things of that nature. And a great troubling would come up on the earth. A troubling that nobody expects. And people would desire to commit suicide. But they'd be barely alive, but alive. Tormented, both in body and mind. And their thoughts tormented. Now I want you guys to imagine something, because everything, every single dream I've ever had was devoid of children. Could you imagine life here on this earth? No children. The cities destroyed, ravaged by war. Conditions unfavorable. Many things burning. Nowhere to run. How empty of a world this would be. But I can see where people would be in misery. But here you have an additional component. These things that are tormenting people. A scorpion, by the way. A scorpion carries venom. So does a serpent. Right? In this context, it says, these things that come out of the bottomless pit have power, scorpions have power, that they would torment men five months, that people would desire to die but would not be able to. The torment of these people almost matches that of the book of Daniel. Almost. When devourers come. See, a bug devours things. It devoured quite a few things. A scorpion in particular is a very specific creature, a cannibal, and it never stops. If something were loosed upon the earth from a bottomless pit, no matter what the form, but it would wreak havoc in the minds of those on the earth at a time where they are destitute, miserable. In the book of Isaiah, it mentions a time also where the earth is empty, where it's going to be very, um, it'll be defined another human being will be more precious than any metal, any gold or silver. It gives you an atmosphere of the earth at that time, how empty it is of life, how dead things are. People are walking around and things, right? Not too many, but people are walking around, but just how ugly it is. It is not the life-sustaining world one would be used to. And just to give you a better insight into the mentality of a person, I have an exercise. An exercise for people. To give you an idea of what it would be like in a world that's dark where people are far and few in between. If a person were to turn their breakers off in their homes, right, and all your electronics went off, don't do this if you have kids. It has to be a coordinated thing. But if you turn that off, say you turned it off for three days, most people cannot do it. In fact, with that challenge, most people couldn't do it for three days. They would always have an excuse to turn the power back on. The truth is, a power outage, right? When people have power outages, they can't use their stuff. For about three years, I talked to a lot of people about power outages and compiled some findings. People said very similar things. But to give you an idea, 
as to how we operate without our comfort toys. When people had power outages, they said the first, you know, first night or two was fine. After that, you realized how much junk you had that was unusable. Anybody else share that sentiment? Anybody else have a power outage for a long time? All of a sudden, you look around and you say, look at all this useless stuff. And it's, it's conflicting emotions. You want the power back on quickly. So you call them a thousand times and nothing happens. Can you guys imagine? Listen, it, it, the shapes of the locusts were like in the horses prepared on the battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were the faces of men. They had their hair as the hair of a woman, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates, and it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of the wings was as the sound of chariots and many horses running into battle. They had tails like an scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, multiple stings, plural, in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. They had a king over them which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in, in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now, Apollyon, or Abaddon, was a king over them, but he was still in the bottomless pit until they were all unleashed, unlocked. And then they wreaked havoc all over the earth. Now, keep in mind, the 144,000 are here, so let's continue to read. It says, after this king, it says, and one more is passed, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. So you have these things. After the angel with the key to the bottomless pit opens up the pit and lets these things out, which means that pit has not been opened. The bottomless pit is not open. And if the bottomless, do you guys know what the other name for the bottomless pit is? You guys know what that is? And when was it sealed up? Who shut that thing off and when did that happen? That's in your Bibles too. Don't worry. We'll get to all of that. But I want you to know that these things are not messing with you right now because they're in the bottomless pit. They're not among you. And nobody, evidently nobody can send anything to the bottomless pit because it's locked up. There is another name for the bottomless pit. And that pit's not opened. So what are you being contending with? Hmm? We're going to square all that away. What in the world have you been contending with here on the face of the earth? All these spirits and things jumping around and hopping around. What have you been contending with? Let's continue. One war is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Now, this is, this keep, keep, stay with me on this one. And the sixth angel sounded. I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of men. So they were to slay a third part of men. That's Revelation 9.15, 9.16. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. I heard the number of them. That's an emphasis on that number. He heard the number of them. That's an emphasis on the number. And thus I saw the horses in a vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. Out of their mouths issued forth, issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Now, th their sole purpose was to slay a third part of men. A third part of men, right? That's, that's what they were here to do. Now, so you have people tormented on the earth, but they were to kill a third part of men, not just to torment them, but to kill them, to kill them. So first, you have the torments of mankind, 
which is a woe upon the earth. But then you have these things that come up. The 200,000 thousand horses, these things. In, in Revelation 9, 18, it says, by these, three was the third part of men killed by fire, by smoke, by brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. So one third of humanity was killed from the fire, smoke, and brimstone that came out of the mouths. Right? It came out of the mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. So now we have another element, the serpents, the scorpions, the serpents, of which Christ was consistently giving us a reference into things. Listen, so they, they killed a third part of humanity, right? But listen to this. Highlight this. This will clear up a lot for you. You ready? Get your highlighters out. Might want to highlight this. Verse 920. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should do, that they should uh, uh, not worship devils of idols of gold, silver, and of brass, and of stone, and of wood, that neither can see, nor can hear, nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. So one third was killed, and it just said, we, we just found out that the people who were not killed by the fire, smoke, and brimstone that issued forth of their mouths, the ones that were still left on the earth, they did not repent. So who's alive on the earth? Do you all see that? Do you see that? The rest of the people who were not killed, they did not repent. It said the rest of that. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I believe the word of God. I believe it wholeheartedly. That means that the earth is corrupt. There's no good left in the earth, save for the 144,000, which have to witness all this stuff. Do you all see that? That's 100% accountability is what that is. It's telling us who's on the earth and who's not. So at this point, we're the righteous. We're there. Well, we read that before this, didn't we? We already read that about the righteous. We know where they are. They came out of great tribulation. Life. They did, these guys who were left, they didn't repent. They did not repent at all. Immediately in Revelation 10, it says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was, as it were, the sun, and his feet pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book opened. And he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roared. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered the voices. Here we are with those seven thunders again. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which, which I saw stand upon the sea, and upon the earth lifted up his hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things therein, and the earth and the things therein, and the sea and the things therein, which are therein, that there should be time no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he had declared to his servants, the prophets. Do you all see that? The seventh trump is the last trump. The declaration of the fulfillment of what God set into motion a long time ago. A huge milestone, but also the ending of hidden things. 
Listen, let me continue real quick. He says, in the voice, which I heard from the from heaven, spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book, which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but in thy mouth shall be sweet as honey. Where have you guys heard this before? Huh? Where have you guys heard that before? I'll share it with you in a minute. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand. I ate it up. And it was in my mouth and sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it up, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. He just said to John, you're going to have to prophesy again before many people's nations, tongues, and kings. So let me break this down. That little book he had, that little book, there are little books in other parts of the Bible. And every time a little book is mentioned, right, that little book contains something supernaturally put in there. The same little book. For one, it was a little book. For another, it was a scroll. Either way, it was something divinely written on these things. One who almost fell over in the grass. For the one who, had, who ate this little book and the one in the Old Testament who ate the scroll, there was a change within them. Do you guys know what that is? Now, nobody ever speaks about John coming back in the last days and prophesying. Hmm? Who do you hear about people saying has to come back? Who do you guys hear? You hear the declaration God made in the Old Testament about Elijah, correct? Because everybody speaks of the two witnesses. Nobody ever mentions John, do they? Good thing I don't go with what people say. In fact, you don't hear anybody talking about John, do you? So let me tell you something. Let me tell you guys something. Now, Revelation 10, 11. He says, Thou must prophesy again before many people's nations, tongues, and kings. When John took that book and he ate it, those were the declarations. In his mouth, they're always sweet. The bitterness in the belly here, here's why. Because prophecy is sweet in the mouth. But as soon as you realize it's coming, as soon as you realize what part you play, as soon as you comprehend, all those you love are not going to accept it. You guys see that? All right. John was told he had to come back. But something strange has been happening with you all. With all of us. But let me tell you about Elijah. Did Elijah come back? Already to turn the hearts of the children back to the father and vice versa. Jesus said he did. Jesus said he came back and it was John the Baptist. They asked John the Baptist. Was he the Christ or was he Elijah? He said, no. No, I'm just a voice crying out in the wilderness. That's what he said. But Jesus said something different. Jesus said he was Elijah. But he had come back to do exactly what God sent him to do. Now, even today, people appear to have not read that in the New Testament. When Jesus said that Elijah has already come because he said, you, you guys heard it was, it was said that Elijah will come back. And Jesus said, I'll tell you the truth. You know, he's already come back. It was John the Baptist, and you chopped his head off. Now, John did not know he was Elijah. Why? Because he operated by the spirit of Elijah. He did exactly 
what Elijah was prophesied to do when he came back. But John had no idea. He carried the spirit of Elijah. All John, all uh, John the Baptist knew was obedience. When you are walking your walk, you're not concerned about what spirit you carry. You're concerned about the work of the Lord. And when you're taken over with a strong sense of desire to serve, I can assure you, you're not, you don't care what spirit you carry. You care about the work of the Lord, and he truly gave his life for that. Everybody else was debating. But he came back by way of the spirit. See that? That's how people miss the fulfillment of the Lord. Jesus said he fulfilled that prophecy. He said he turned the hearts of the father back to the children and vice versa. That's what he was saying, make straight the way of the Lord. That's exactly what he did. But it was missed just like they missed the Messiah coming. And I'll keep mentioning that. How in the world can all those experts miss Jesus coming to earth? They couldn't see him. They didn't even know him just like they did not know John the Baptist. Why? Because Jesus told them the Bible is to be discerned spiritually. And they were trying to discern it logically. Now, that was John the Baptist. But what about John on the Isle of Patmos? I cannot help but to see this. Every single one of you was born with revelation in you. You can't explain it, and nobody else can either. But you were born with an acquaintance with revelation, with prophecy, specifically with the end time. You were born with it, and you cannot help but to open your mouth and say revelation is real. Do you not know that many others before you ran away, they were terrified of revelation, not you. You were born with it. If Elijah coming back in John the Baptist, of which John did not know, is any indication of what God is doing, then you might want to Think about, why is it? Why is it that Revelation is so familiar to all of you? Why are you called to specific parts of Revelation so strongly? And why, of your family and, and everybody around you, are you the one that can embrace the whole thing and they cannot? Haven't you noticed, even those of you who know it spiritually, you battling your minds with logic. You're trying to see it logically. God gave it to you spiritually. And logic is not winning out. Because every time something happens in the world, it does not make sense logically. It doesn't line up logically. But spiritually, something is taking place, and you're trying not to get left behind. Don't you know people are out there with supercomputers trying to decipher revelation? Jesus already told them. It must be understood spiritually. You're not going to do it by computer. AI is not going to do it either. And they, just like just what I just told you, how many, how many people have ever given a sermon on Elijah coming back? As per the words of Christ Jesus, hardly nobody. You got people out there right now, Elijah's coming, Elijah's coming. The same way they did Christ when he walked the earth. And we'll say, there's Christ. No, no, it isn't. It's not Christ because Christ was going to have this uh, uh, buckle on his left side hanging three inches below. You know, some weird fact they thought of. So they had already predetermined what they were looking for within their own context of their own knowledge. Thus, they were spiritually blind. But the apostles, they didn't have any of that. They were unlearned men so they could actually see spiritually. Those who were learned were confused by their preconceived notions, by believing their own theology. And when you believe your own theology, you cannot accept the spiritual truth when it's given. God gives the truth when the truth is needed, just like he will reveal the Antichrist 
when the Antichrist is revealed by him, we'll all know exactly who it is. Well, everybody's guessing, and they've been wrong. Every single time up to this year, they've been wrong. The Lord told us he would be revealed. All people have to do is wait. That's all they have to do. But just like they did in the days of old. Because nobody contested what sounded so good. They actually began to believe in their own writings. And when they believed in their own writings, they could not see Jesus of Nazareth. They did not see Elijah. Yet the son of the living God, Jesus of Nazareth, told us that was Elijah coming back just as he was prophesied to do. But they could not see it. They couldn't even accept it. And here we are again. Things are happening all around you. Things that could be seen. But if I was set on a journey, right, to go to a specific store, to get a specific thing, to bring back at a specific time, then my mind is going to be on the journey assigned to me by people. Thus, I'll miss anything else along the way, especially if I'm really focused, really astute about my assignment. I'm not going to see anything else. It's kind of like looking for something lost in your house, right? You go around looking for that lost thing, you find everything else but the lost thing, right? Anybody ever do that? You ever say, but God, I got to find this thing, right? But you find everything else you lost a week prior. Well, there that thing is. Well, let me put it right there and I'll come back and get a winner. That's it. You find everything else. And then, it came, then by accident, you find what you were looking for. And then... A day later, you say, wait a minute, when I was looking for that thing, I found that thing. Now, let me go back and find the other thing. But because you were so focused on finding the first object, you paid no attention on the location of the other objects. Now you're hunting again. Always hunting. Always hunting. But a nipper person would walk with her eyes open. Have an assignment, sure, but be observant of all things. That's where you want to be. That's where you want to be. Especially with the Word of God. Okay, folks. You guys get that one? That's a, that's a big one to swallow, isn't it? That's a big one to swallow. What that really means is, don't think that the book of Revelation is somehow going to become unfamiliar to you as time goes on, because that's not the truth. There's a strength to this prophecy in you that cannot be undone. I see the pattern. It's a simple thing to see. The problem is it's not logical. No, it's not logical. It's spiritual, yes. And it's happening to so many of a very specific set of generations who just so happen to live in a time when the earth is actually changing with notable differences. When people are changing with notable differences. When countries are failing with notable differences. All these things happening at one time. I don't believe in coincidence. I don't. Now, I certainly don't believe in the ideologies of people, of men, because they tend to bound, they tend to base everything based off flesh and experience of flesh. And I'd rather have it from the most high. Mm -hmm. Somebody said the angel that fell from heaven to earth with the key, is that that? No, 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 no. That's not the fallen angels. I want you to take note of something, right? John perceived or he saw an angel from the heavens, right, coming to the earth, to, but it was a key to the bottomless pit was given to him. So he had him run and steal it. The key to the bottomless pit was given to him. So who would have the key to the gates of hell? Why are there gates on hell? Anybody ever figure that out? Satan cannot 
unlock himself from hell and come and go like the movies say. That That's movie stuff. That's some person's imagination to support the breakdown of your faith. And if you believe that, you also believe that demons can come and go as they please. Well, if that's the case, then why were the demonic entities that Jesus came across so terrified of he, him, sending them to hell itself? And you know what they said? Have you come? Have you come to send us to that place before the time? So there's an appointed time. They're not there yet. Those who are dwelling topside are not there yet. It's right there in the Bible. It is extremely consistent. Here's the problem, though. People have thought up and written about so many different theories. They believe in that. And here's my problem. The Bible says if a man cannot bridle his own tongue, that man's religion is vain. You know what that means? If a person is overtaken by anger, how can their way of following the Lord be working? It's not. They can't even overcome anger within themselves. Think about it. Think about it. This violent streak that's going through the earth, people can't overcome it. So they have a theory or some method they think is real, and they believe in these flesh-bound ways that, that only make sense if you're living in New York City, some metropolitan city of how things would operate, not for the spirit realm. There are far too many people who act like they've been born in the spirit realm, went to school in Ivy League in the spirit realm, and then hopped over to this flesh realm to tell everybody about it. You see that every single day. Well, a spirit, you know, a, a, a child spirit, See, they're not adults, and so they don't know what's, uh, you know, happening. No, that's hogwash. All of us hogwash. Well, a spirit requires energy. No, it does not. That's hogwash. They're making up theories and concepts based upon other theories and concepts in science, trying to make a flow chart of what is more plausible to sell to the public. And now they're actually believing in it. You know, the Lord warned us. The Lord warned us about a strong delusion of how men would believe a lie because they did not love the truth. Because when you love the truth, you're going to get your answers from the truth, not from some Ivy League school, not from some person out there who's hunting ghosts, not from CERN. That's not where you're going to get your spiritual answers from. You're going to have insights from the Lord that will cover all material, material realms. Believe me, the Lord has given me answers to equations I couldn't possibly know. He's been so timely all throughout my life and career. And it's been him the entire time. But there's a wickedness working in this earth, and it will destroy your faith if you allow it. For some of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's almost an underlying fear. You're terrified to share it because you know so many people operate by it. They're operating by this same crooked thing. The ways and rituals of men that have crept in to the holy word of God. Many complicit. Too many. The Lord is showing us his truth. He demonstrates his truth. Look deep within and reflect, and you'll see it. Folks, I'm going to leave with that for tonight. I'm going to say God bless everybody. We're going to resume this tomorrow, by the way, because we're making such good uh, uh, progress, right? Everything was rewired safely uh, this weekend. And, of course, with... IT things and programming, uh, five-minute jobs sometimes take five days. That's what happened. But uh, everything works that way. Everything is working pretty well. It is working pretty well. So that's our, you know, that's one step in the right direction, right? So now we don't have to worry about uh, uh, further things blowing up. And we can get on with it. We have outreach to do. We have a lot to do. 
No, I can't say anything else about it. You guys will discover it day by day. Okay? Pray for one another. Remember, collectively, collectively, we all have the truth. Individually, we have the truth in part. That means what you have within you is critical to the rest of us. So don't isolate yourself in these times. Don't do that. Try not to do that. The um, Because our equipment is working good, we're loading in our base foundation and framework back into the system again, and we're going to swap everything over to it so the website will be running a little differently. We're going to resume our chat operations and get them back in their peak amount and see how far we can go. We'll be at full strength in certain aspects, not, not anything that will hinder us, but we'll be at full strength within one more month. So that is excellent, and all of that is due to you guys. So God bless you for that. That covered them. Uh, we're on track to do that. Right? We're on track. Speaking of that, too, guys, take care of your places of worship. Please take care of them. Take care of them. I know that in this time that we live in, right, there's, the people are... Uh, People are reluctant for some reason and reluctant to do a lot of things. Try not to be that way, right? But the more open we are, the more that won't be an issue, especially with you guys one towards another. Oh, by the way, I have an article coming out on COT. It deals with a preemptive strike. That'll probably be one, well, that's only one of the last ones before 37's uh, area goes up. He's much more thorough in those areas. But the preempt is not noise. So please know that. It's on the way. Bless you guys. I'm going to see you all tomorrow.